coming this evening. My name is Angela Hall, and I am the admission manager for the College of Osteopathic Medicine. So on behalf of our office, welcome tonight. We are glad that you've joined us. Um, so I want to very briefly just kind of mention how the schedule is going to work tonight. Dr. Polk is going to speak with you for about 45 minutes uh, this evening, and then we will transition to Dr. Lewis, who's one of our OMM faculty, and he will discuss osteopathic medicine with you and also do a demonstration of OMM for those of you that um, have yet to experience or see it before. Then our current students um, are going to give you a tour of campus so you are able to see some of our labs in action of what happens here um, in terms of education for the osteopathic students. And then we're going to finally wrap up with a panel of our students so you can hear from them directly on their experiences as a DMU student. One thing I want to highlight is in your purple bags, you have note cards. So if there are times throughout the evening that you have a question, um, whether it's for the students <coughs> primarily, but also Dr. Polk, feel free to write your questions out, and we will collect those later this evening to make sure that you get your questions answered before you leave tonight, okay? So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. J.D. Polk, who is the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he can tell you the rest. Thanks, Dr. Polk. Thank you, ma'am. Well, thanks for joining us. Just so I have an idea who all I'm talking to. How, how many are physicians? Uh, I, I knew we had a couple in here. How many are school counselors that are trying to get the skinny on things? I, 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 I talked to you in the hall, in the aisle, right? Yeah. You were stealing all the cookies. Uh, how, many are, how many are prospective students? Uh, good. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is give you an idea on the landscape, how things have, are, have changed, how things are changing, where they're going so that as you apply for medical school and so that the counselors know as well uh, what to look for, what things that uh, the admissions folks look for as well, and, and what, as a dean, what, what do we look for in administration when, when folks are applying. And, and it's bad in that, my, where's my two physicians again? It, uh, it's changed a lot since we went through. I mean, like all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, and so, you know, I'll, the students make fun of me because I'll make reference to some show that they've never heard of before. I had a faculty colleague that was dressed in a turtleneck the other day, and I said he looked like Mannix, and nobody had any idea who I was talking about. So, um, first, let me give you a little bit of my background and how I got here. I'm actually uh, boarded in emergency medicine and ER trained. I uh, did my medical school at A.T. Still University, south of here in Missouri. I uh, did my residency in emergency medicine, was the chief resident in emergency medicine at Mount Sinai in Cleveland. I uh, did a lot of uh, ER and trauma in Cleveland. I uh, was the chief of LifeLight. Uh, LifeLight in Cleveland flies with a critical care physician and nurse. And so I spent half of my time in the level one trauma center as an ER attending and half on the helicopter going out to accident scenes and doing LVADs and all of those things. Uh, because I had an exorbitant amount of debt, uh, much like you all are going to inherit, uh, I joined the Air Force Reserve in order because they had a, a deal at the time uh, where they would pay off about 50 grand worth of your loans, which was a lot back then for me. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's only a weekend a month, two weeks in the summer, that won't be a problem. Uh, after I deployed uh, in wartime, I thought maybe uh, there's a little bit more to this than I thought. Um, and I, I got a lot of experience, unfortunately, in critical care air transport going back and forth to Germany, uh, and then also uh, supported space shuttle launches and landings uh, and search and rescue on the helicopter there. Because when the space shuttle would go up, they would have four helicopters standing by in case the astronauts had to bail out. And the, uh, and, you know, serendipity happens. Uh, I happened, you know, to be down there about four or five missions and the NASA flight surgeon said, you know, you're not bad at this. We got an opening at NASA. Why don't you come down? Uh, so your parents will understand this, but I, I just built our nice attending doctor house, you know, in the neighborhood where you go out to get the mail and you see all the other doctors and say, doctor, 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 and you get your mail. And we just built a nice house. Got all the landscape done. And what happens usually when you get your house just the way you want it is you move. Uh, and so we moved down to Houston, took a 70 grand pay cut, and I started to work for NASA. Uh, and NASA has half of their mission uh, with the space station. Uh, they do half of their training in Moscow and half in the U.S. Uh, and so I actually lived in Moscow six months out of the year for several years, so I'm fluent in Russian, which does not help me in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, yet. Uh, although Nick and I can have a conversation, that's about it. 
Um, and I worked my way up as the chief of MedOps at, at NASA and then the chief of clinical operations at NASA and the chief of all of space medicine at NASA and was there for a decade. And then, uh, do you all remember the Chilean mine accident? Uh, I was the consultant from NASA that went down to figure out how to get 33 Chilean miners out of a mine. Uh, and then from there, was invited by the White House to be the principal deputy assistant secretary of Homeland Security. So I went to D.C. to do that job and then uh, became the assistant secretary of Homeland Security. And then Dr. Uh, Janet Napolitano, who was my boss, told me in April that she was leaving uh, Homeland Security to be the uh, president of University of California. And usually when the secretary tells you that she's leaving, that's kind of code for, by the way, there's going to be a new secretary who likes their own assistant secretaries. So it's a really good time to get your CV brushed up. And so uh, I applied for the dean spot that opened up about the week after that. And here I am, a year and six months later. I will tell you that things have changed a lot in medical school, but they are still changing. And I've got a few slides that I'll just go over as a memory jogger for some of the things that are changing. And I don't know if I have a little clicker to do this remotely, but I'll see what I can do here. So one thing for admissions, <clears throat> it's changed drastically and that it's now a holistic process. Well, what does that mean? That means before it used to be your GPA and your MCATs, uh, and that was it. But now we've discovered that that's not the whole story. And the reason that we do that, oh, thanks. Thanks, you're much obliged. Which button is it, this one? That one, okay. Um, and I'll give you a, a good example. Let's say somebody's got a 3.4 GPA, but they're working full time as well and they've got one kid at home that they're trying to take care of in between times, uh, is that person the same as somebody that has a 3.8 that took six years to get through their four-year school, did you know 12 credit hours per semester, uh, has no responsibilities, daddy paid for everything, and they're not working at all? Probably not. Uh, you know, so a grade doesn't tell you everything. Um, and so the, one of the things that they're looking at now, and, and the MCAT has not been very predictive for us. Uh, I know that's a shocker to you all, but you know, that the question of a, what is the coefficient of, and tangent of an angle of a box sliding down an inclined plane uh, doesn't really translate well into what kind of doctor you're going to be. Big shock. Uh, now, they're redoing the MCAT this year. And so we'll talk about some of that as well. So there's changes to the MCAT. Is that me going all over the place? Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, everybody's getting dizzy. Uh, so it's a holistic process. What they will do is they will bring you in and, and look at the whole aspects of your application. What things have you done uh, for other than medical school uh, application? Have you done any volunteer work? Uh, do you work part-time while you're going to school? Do you do X? Uh, you know, are you uh, volunteering uh, at the homeless shelter? Are you doing, uh, you know, a, a church trip to Cambodia to do medical trips, that type of thing? Um, and a lot of what they're looking for now is a, what I call a service before self mentality. And I'll, I'll show you a slide on that as well. Uh, GPA, especially science GPA. Now, we do worry somewhat about GPA and that. Um, if you have a 3.0, um, you're going to struggle. And we don't want to accept you if you've only got a 2.9 or a 3.0 because it would be unfair for us to allow you to accrue 50 grand worth of debt in your first year knowing that you're not going to succeed, quite bluntly. Um, and the biggest thing for medical school and the change between undergraduate and medical school the, the substance material is not horribly hard. All of you in this room can understand the stuff that folks are lecturing about and can conceive it. The biggest part of medical school is the volume. You are literally, most of you are used to probably taking, I, I'll go on an assumption, about 15 credit hours per semester. Now strap on 25. Uh, and, oh, by the way, labs and studying, and uh, you're going to be in some student groups and doing some volunteering and doing uh, other things as well. Uh, so that's the biggest change that we see. And, and initially what we do, when students are 
you know, we have dual degrees that they can take. You can take your MPH and your DO, or your DO and your M MHA, and things like that. We don't allow anyone to do a dual degree course their first semester, because what we see typically is there's a little culture shock when folks get here. They're going through anatomy, and sometimes it's the first time people have seen a dead body. Now, not only are you seeing it, you're carving on it and doing dissection. And by the way, we're going to all, how many of you have had biochem? I imagine most of you, if not all of you, yes. Uh, all of the biochem that you had in undergrad, we will cover in the first three weeks. Uh, after that, your, what you learned in undergrad in biochem has been exhausted. Uh, and so a lot of people think, oh, I've had biochem. This won't be that bad. Uh, it won't, it's not that it's that bad. It's just that it's at a much higher level. And so we literally are going to cover all of your biochem that you've had before in the first three weeks. Week four, it's starting anew for you. So it's, it's a huge volume that people are like, oh, my gosh. And I've got a test on Monday. And then I've got another test on Tuesday. And then I have a test on Thursday. And I've got a lab on Friday. And it seems like it's never ending. And now it's not to dissuade you from going into medical school. Everyone's like, oh, great. I don't think I'm going to apply now. But that's the biggest thing is that it's not that the information is hard or that you are not intelligent enough to acquire it and know it. Because that's not the case. It is the volume. Um, is that any, any medical students uh, want to throw in an opinion on that one? What do you guys think? Nick? <laughs> Wait, would you, what would you say was the biggest culture shock for you, all, all of you guys? Was it the volume? Was it the, uh, or the type of information? Yep. Yep. Now, one thing that has changed to their advantage, which us old physicians did not have, um, now everything's recorded. So that if, you know, I didn't feel like going to biochem today, I could watch the biochem lecture this afternoon on MPEG. Uh, or before the exam, if I didn't get a concept, I could watch it two or three times until I got the concept. Whereas when we went through, somebody wrote with on chalk, they don't know what chalk is, by the way, chalk, <laughs> And he raced with the other hand, and if you didn't get it at the time, then you'd check it at note pool, right? And then, and if you didn't get there at note pool, you were screwed. And, and now they've got it to where they can see it anytime they want. And so I, I'm jealous of that sometimes. Uh, but that also means, you know, in, in, in Gen Y, they're used to sitting down at Starbucks and, and cranking it open and putting their headphones on and listening to Foo Fighters and... Uh, and uh, doing it. And that's, that's not something that, that our generation is used to. So how they learn has changed a great deal as well. Uh, we've got volunteer efforts. That's what they're going to look for as well. Uh, as we talked about a service mentality. Additional activities tell us something about you as a person. Distance traveled. Distance traveled is uh, did folks have or overcome hardship? That's not to say that you all have to have a hardship. But we look at some of those things as well when we you know, if somebody's got a 3.4, but they're a single parent, they're taking care of two kids and working a job at night and on the weekends, that means something to us. Uh, that means that when they only have to worry about medical school and hopefully somebody's helping with their kids, that might, they might actually do better because they're, they have less responsibility than they did before. Uh, so we look at those things. And then interviewing. What do, you know, some schools don't interview. Some, you know, some just go by the paper aspects. Uh, we can tell a lot by the interview. A lot of it is based on the EQ. We're looking for you to see what your emotional intelligence is. Uh, are you thinking like an adult? Are you thinking like a future physician would be? Um, and so those are things that we're looking at. Now, MCAT changes. Uh, imagine most of you have probably this many books studying for the MCAT. Uh, the MCAT is changing in that they are adding what I would call the soft sciences as well. So they're putting sociology uh, into the MCAT and some of the other softer sciences into the MCAT. Now, why would, any idea why they're doing that? Anybody got any guess? A couple of reasons. One, to be more holistic. And I'll, I'll give you a good example. If I see a, a 12-year-old overweight child in my office 
who is pre-diabetic, bordering, you know, on, on diabetes. And I write them for a script uh, for something for glucose control. Is that going to solve the issue? And the answer is no. It, especially if that child's from a, a school in the inner city and lower socioeconomic class where there, there is no whole foods across the street. And maybe their only uh, access to food is the McDonald's across the street. And the schools have four vending machines with loaded with crap in them. Uh, so unless you address some of the social aspects and the aspects beyond the office, uh, you're not going to take care of that patient or solve that patient's issue. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons they're bringing in some of the soft sciences. The other one, quite frankly, is because we are not getting a lot of doctors going into primary care. And so if you are a genius in physics and a genius in organic chemistry, but you fail in sociology, that tells me something about you. That tells me, hmm, you might be in the research area, but you probably are not going to be the primary care physician. You, you don't like my... <laughs> Drew, Drew's getting vertigo, so he's, he's decided, thank you. Uh, he decided rather than have you all throw up, uh, that he would change that. Uh, so they're making some changes to that. What, what does that mean? I, I will tell you, first of all, we, we see quite often that there is about a six-point spread between those who take a prep course for the MCAT versus those that don't. So if, if you take the MCAT and you didn't do so hot, let's say you got a 22 on it, uh, you can take it again. We get both your scores, but if, if your next score is 28, we take the 28, and that's what we hold on to. Uh, so we see consistently those that do a prep course do better. A lot of it is just getting used to those types of questions and how to answer those. So if you haven't done a prep course or if you haven't taken the MCAT, I do recommend it, uh, just to get you in the habit of seeing those types of questions and what they're going to do. But the MCAT, as I said before, does not necessarily tell us whether or not you're going to be a good doctor. So we have what's called a mean with a fair wide spread on some of those things. So our mean right now is uh, 28.5 or 29. I can't remember what it is this year. Angela would have to correct me. So you know, some schools will shoot for the high 30s uh, or the mid 30s for their MCATs. That, I, I will tell you, those folks are typically going towards the research end of things. Uh, the folks that are in that, that soft, nice point that we like is between that area of 27 and 32, uh, with a mean being around 28.5 or 29. Um, and then, you know, that doesn't mean that if you get a 26 that you're not getting in, but it means you have an uphill battle that you might have to show that your GPA is, is good enough, that your other skills, the other things in your application uh, are good enough. And so, again, remember, it's a holistic process. Grades. And so this is, a, this is to show you, this is a table from the 2011-2013 applicants accepted to at least one medical school with their GPA and their MCAT. And so what you see is that obviously the higher on either side, the better you do. Now the, the purplish burgundy circle is DMU, is where we're looking at folks for. Um, you know, are we looking for the MCAT of 39 and a GPA of 4.0? No, because that's not our mission. Our mission is to create primary care physicians for the most part and to create folks that know a lot about everything, not a lot about one thing, uh, such as researchers, et cetera. And so you will see that you know, a lot of our students that get accepted may get accepted to more than one medical school, uh, but we have great stats and data to show who is going to be successful here and then how are they going to match into residency? And how does that turn into primary care physicians? That doesn't mean that you can't be something else, like a rocket scientist at NASA. Uh, it just means that that's our mission mostly is aimed at primary care. Service before self, uh, we see this a lot with a lot of our applicants. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that you have to go and afford a really expensive trip to Honduras. Uh, but it does mean that we want to see, are you doing something like volunteering with the Red Cross? Are you doing something like being a medical scribe? Are you doing uh, something that shows that you are volunteering or doing some type of service? Um, and especially in this particular generation, quite frankly, we're looking for folks that are thinking beyond me 
Uh, and so that's one thing that we look for. And, and that's probably one of the things that separates the osteopathic world from the allopathic world more is that we probably have more volunteer hours in the osteopathic world with our students than they do on the MD side. The, the last class that graduated had, what was it, Tom, about 45,000 hours when they graduated uh, between all of the students uh, uh, for their four years of medical school. Uh, that's a lot of hours uh, for the graduating class. Now, that, that, that's a lot of different things. That's volunteering at the homeless shelter. That's, uh, you know, doing the service trips and global health. That's, uh, you know, doing things like uh, putting in smoke alarm batteries for the Red Cross and homes. So that's one of the things that we look for. It doesn't have to be grandiose. You don't have to say, I went and saved 40 Ebola patients in Liberia. Uh, you know, good on you if you're able to do that, but it doesn't have to be grandiose. It just has to show that you have a service mentality, okay? Fit. We're also looking for fit. Uh, you know, uh, we're looking to see if this class pulls in, and we pull all these folks in. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I don't want everybody to look the same. I don't want a carbon copy of, of each medical student. I want, when you are in class, for there to be a wide dispersion of race, religion, background, where you're at, because you're all going to learn from each other as well. When we have discussions on diversity, uh, you know, how you treat somebody in rural Iowa is different than how you treat somebody, perhaps, in downtown New York. Uh, you know. And, and the, the students get a lot of diversity training as well. Uh, you know, a lot of that can be on race, and a lot of it can be on handicap, a lot of it can be on the LGBT aspects. Uh, but to make sure that when you're approaching a patient, that you approach them with that mindset uh, of, of looking at, at their particular uh, risks from their diversity and their profile, uh, knowing that you are aligning treatments according to their different social backgrounds as well that they're going to be able to follow. Uh, and so we look at that also on admissions to make sure that we have a broad and diverse background of folks that we are bringing in. We do not want to have 220 students that all came from West Des Moines. Uh, you know, it's got to be a little bit broader than that. <coughs> Where's medical education headed? Medical education, to be honest, has not changed much in the last 100 years. There was the Flexner Report, uh, you know, back, golly, I think it was 1910 or 1915, somewhere in there. Uh, and the Flexner Report was, all right, anatomy, physiology, all of these things that we do now. And, in, and medical school has, for 100 years, been the sage on the stage. Somebody talking to a chart, PowerPoint, or Blackboard. Um, <clears throat> and it's morphing from that. It's morphing from that to do case scenarios and things. Uh, and to give you patient exposures earlier on so that uh, what we found is that you'll tend to remember things if you can relate it to a patient. If I sat up here and talked to you about diabetic ketoacidosis for an hour, your eyes would glaze over. But if I had a diabetic ketoacidosis patient in front of you, and you smell the ketones from that patient, and you see that they're tach tachypnic and tachycardic, et cetera, you will remember that for the rest of your life. And so how to put some of those things in context where you are in your first semester, you are not used to touching people unless it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, or significant other, and suddenly you're going to be touching each other, uh, up close and personal, doing you know, OMM and physical exam and et cetera, and physical diagnosis, and in the spalls, you're going to be asking folks questions, total strangers, questions about their sex life. We are not used to doing that in the general public. But as physicians, you have to get used to that. Uh, and you have to not only get used to it, but you have to look comfortable doing it so that you don't make them uncomfortable. Uh, and so a lot of that is breaking down your social barriers that you have built up for 20 years because you're not used to doing those things. Most of us, you, and you can, you can see the difference in the students, by the way, uh, when, when we, they first get there, they have the, the 18 inches of clearance, right, uh, that we all learn somehow mis mysteriously when we're in line. You know, you don't get any closer than 18 inches when you're in the line at Kmart or et cetera. 
Uh, and so you'll see the students. I can tell when the students are here the first week, they've got that 18 inches of clearance when they're in the cafeteria. But, and then three months later, after they've been used to hugging on each other, crunching each other, and doing everything else, it's like, hey, man, you want to eat that cookie? And, and right on top of each other. <clears throat> so, you know, we all have some social barriers that we have built up um, uh, because, you know, it, from politeness sake and et cetera, which as physicians, you violate every day. I mean, it's, you know, we do a lot of checking our prostates and, uh, you know, you got to get over that. And, and you can't be fearful of saying, well, Mr. Johnson, you're 46 and uh, you got a little delayed stream. Guess what? Love you. Hugs, kisses. We're going to do a prostate exam today. You can't say, oh, that's, ooh, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, it's, it's now a different venue. You are a physician. You are thinking much differently. Um, which, by the way, uh, you, because you are dissecting people and you start to look at anatomy and physiology, uh, and, and not to say that you look at patients as anatomy and physiology. You still look at the patient and the whole patient, et cetera, but you don't view them in the same way. Um, you know, p- people always, my wife always wonder, all right, how do you do paps and pelvics and stuff? Honestly, it's anatomy at that time. You are focused on it's the anatomy and you're worried about the malady at the time. It is not all of those social things that you have thought about and learned about over the last 20 years. It is the anatomy. Uh, and so you, you get in that habit. You're, you have a different mindset when you're a physician. But where is that going? It's going to change. Partly from Gen Y, they weren't they learn electronically. It used to be you had to be you know mandatory attendance at medical school. Now you can watch the lecture from Starbucks. Uh, some of these things are going to migrate to all right. Some of these coursework things you're going to learn on your own at different times, and then you're going to come in and talk about the case scenarios at medical school. And so you know I I don't need to lecture to you about diabetic ketoacidosis, I can, you can watch the lecture at night, the night before, and then we'll have two diabetic patients come in, and then we'll talk about their symptoms and have people rotate and examine them. That's where things are going to be moving. And where's medicine headed? Now, this one's an interesting one. Whether you like the Affordable Care Act or not, there are changes from the, that are coming about from the Affordable Care Act. Um, <coughs> and I will, I will tell you, I sincerely doubt that the whole thing will get repealed. Pieces of it might get be, you know. I've never seen any policy, quite frankly, that was ever invented by government that didn't get morphed or changed to a version two and version three and, and added on or changed or morphed over time. And that'll happen with this as well. But one of the things that it did is it creates, because you have more people covered, you, it creates a demand for primary care physicians. Uh, and that, quite frankly, is where DOs have an advantage over our MD brethren. Uh, we create more primary care physicians than, than anybody. On average, uh, the average DO medical school creates, you know, in their graduating class, greater than 50% are going into primary care. Uh, in a typical MD school, that's about 30% or less. Uh, and a lot of that, there's different factors for that. Uh, part of it is debt. You know, if you got $220,000 worth of debt, suddenly plastic surgery lo- and, uh, you know, Ferrari looking really good to you right now. Uh, and so it's hard to convince somebody to go into primary care where they might be struggling uh, for a while, uh, although it's going to change drastically in that case. It's also different than when we went to school in that you could go and then set up your own office. And that is going by the wayside. Now physicians are becoming group practices and members and, and employed by the hospital themselves. Why is that? Well. Let's take the electronic medical record, for example. Now, in order to get reimbursed, you have to have your patient documentation in the electronic medical record, and you have to have what's called meaningful use, meaning that you use that record meaningfully to look at the metrics and the outcomes to project how that patient's going to do. You have to have data that you send back to the government. And how much do you think an electronic medical record system costs, and especially one that does meaningful use and does all this stuff? Dr. Pettit, what do you think? Yeah. So if you had to guess what the average cost is, what would you say it is? For an EMR. Yeah, 
That's exactly it. About a hundred thousand for a for just the you know the Pinto version. That's not the Cadillac version. You guys don't even know what a Pinto is. Uh, <coughs> I have to change that. I have to I have to come up with some new stuff. Uh, nobody knows what a Pinto is. But I will tell you. Whereas the older generation are all, I don't know if I want to go work for the hospital and uh, you know they're you know I don't want, I want to have my own practice. The younger generation not so much worried about that. Because they are more worried, you know, in, in our day, it was, uh, we didn't have restrictions on how long you worked in residency. We worked our tail off till you were blue in the face. And we didn't have restrictions on moonlighting, and we didn't have restrictions on a lot of other things. Now, and it was nothing to carry a pager and get called at night and on weekends, all the time. This generation does not want that. This generation wants to have a family life actually see their kids grow up and actually go to the little Cindy's, uh, you know, dance rehearsal uh, and not miss every Christmas and every New Year. Uh, and so, you know, that, that we used to wear that as a merit badge in the past. Well, you know, I haven't been to seven Christmases. Like, like that was, you know, that was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a tough working cardiologist. He hadn't been to seven Christmases. Uh, and, you know, that's no longer a merit badge anymore. Folks in this generation want to be able to have work-life balance. Uh, and so that's more important to them. So, it, you know, it, when we say to the younger generation, oh, you might have to work for the hospital. And they think, okay, I got Blue Cross Blue Shield. I got this. I got days off. Somebody's going to cover. And I'm only on call every fifth night. Deal. Uh, and that's a lot different than what we went through. But that's some of the changes that are coming. Residency is, and this is the hard part, if you look at that, those lines, a couple of things that aren't told by those lines. Right now, and this is, this is the biggest thing to consider when you are choosing a medical school. Right now, what we will talk, you'll hear people talk about GME. GME is graduate medical education, which is a fancy word for residencies. Right now, there are 26,000 first-year residency slots, meaning that after somebody graduates from medical school, there are 26,000 slots that they can go to. There are 38,000 people applying for them. You have the foreign medical grads, you have the Caribbean schools, you have people that didn't get in last year. So you have literally about 12,000 more people applying for the slots than there are slots. And to the victor go the spoils, meaning only the strong get in. Uh, if you just barely squeaked by in medical school and you went to a third or fourth tier medical school that didn't have a great reputation, your risk is high of not getting into residency. The number one reason for not getting into residency, number one, according to the National Residency Match Program, and I'm on their board, is failure of part one of the boards. You fail part one of the boards, uh, you know, you take three board exams. You fail part one, you're going to have an uphill climb to get residency. So those things are things that you need to look for when you are applying to medical school. One of the biggest, you know, the first ones is board scores. What, what are your board scores? And when you, when you ask that question, the, the, the benchmark that you want to look for is 95%. All schools try to have at least, all of their students have at least a 95% pass rate on the boards. That's the benchmark. And that's the one that they need to at least climb over. If a school doesn't meet 95%, you need to run. Run away, not run to. Run away, because that's a danger sign. That means that you are at high risk to not getting your residency. Um, <coughs> the national average for board scores uh, is about 96.8, almost 97 this year. And so you want to know, all right, are you below the mean, at the mean, or above the mean? Because uh, that's an important thing to know. Uh, DMU right now had a 98% pass rate this last year. So we got, you know, I, I'd like to make it 100 if I could. We're going to try to squeak it out there. And the students know that I have I've whipped and flogged and beaten them lately. Um, but they also know why uh, we're doing that, to make, give them the absolute best opportunity to match uh, into their residency. So that's the thing you need to look for. The first thing, what are the board scores? If somebody doesn't hand, give you a handout that shows what their board scores are, or if it's not on their website, those are red flags. 
uh, it should be transparent enough, and if it's good enough, they'll put, they'll want to market it. They'll want to boast about it. They'll put it on their website. So look for those things. Student satisfaction. Uh, studentdoctor.net, right? Is that the website? Um, or what, what's the, uh, what's the other one? What's the preferred one? Oh, no, you're right. I just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like all websites, you know, you get what you know you pay for, and it's free. So it's uh, you'll get opinions in wide variety. But if you see a a large amount of students that are currently in the medical school that are very unhappy and dissatisfied, then that's a red flag as well. Now the thing about th- that is it also depends on when you ask, because I guarantee you ask any medical student in May of their second year how they're doing, and they're not doing very well. Because uh, they're really stressed because they got finals at that time, and it's a really tough time in their second year when everything gets piled in. But you know, those are things to look for and look to see: is there a, a reputation? And, and when you Google things, if you see, you know, so and so university sued for the ninth time for X, yeah, it might be something to maybe you know be leery of. Um, debt ratio: how much debt are you going to inherit? The average medical student student debt upon graduation is $220,000. My first house was only $100,000. What was your first house? Wow, okay. So this, (laughs) you're beating me on that one. So, I mean, this, 20, man. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's $220,000. Can you imagine paying $220,000 for school? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. That, and, and most of these students that come out don't realize that that's equal to a mortgage. You're essentially paying two mortgages when you get out. And by the way, when you're a resident, you're not making $100,000 a year. Uh, so you're, you're kind of strapped for those first three, four years. And by the way, you've got to start paying them back uh, within a year after you graduate. So there's, you know, it's, it's tough. And so what are the things that you want to look at? You want to look at um, if this school is expensive, uh, is it worth it? All right, you know, maybe if you're going to Harvard and Yale, yes, but other th- places maybe not. And so, are they in the first, second, or third, or fourth tier as far as expense? If you ranked uh, all of the medical schools of the same size and same weight with the same GPAs, et cetera, where would they be ranked? Now, I will tell you, state schools are typically cheaper than private schools. Uh, so we're, we are more expensive than the average state school, but we are less expensive than the average private school. We're actually in the third tier. You've got Kirksville and Kansas City, and all those are more expensive than we are. Um, and so you need to look at that. I mean, there's, there's a little bit to that. You don't want to you know, come out with a massive amount of debt with $300,000 worth of debt. Uh, but look at those things. And then also look, you know, are there payback programs? The state of Iowa just started a program right now to where they will pay off $200,000 of debt, whether it was undergrad or graduate, if you agree to stay in Iowa for five years after your residency. Uh, And I've had students say, oh, I don't know if I want to stay in Iowa for five years just for $200,000. It's not just for $200,000. You got to remember, that's $200,000 paid off over 20 years at two above T-bill, which is equal to about $680,000 over 20 years. That's three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, if somebody would say, I will pay you three quarters of a million dollars to sweat it out in Iowa for five years and pay off all your debt, uh, you would suck it up in Iowa. Uh, uh, nobody shoots at you in Iowa. I, I, I went for 50000 to the military, and it was a little bit different uh, climate than the back roads of Iowa. Uh, so you've got to look at some of those things. Some communities now, we have a, a graduate, she's a fourth year who uh, was a dual degree student. She, she got, she's getting her DO and her MSA uh, this year. And we had a community actually give her a contract to come back and be their surgeon. She hasn't even graduated medical school yet. They will pay off all of her debt, every bit of it, and pay her an incentive and start up her office for her if she agrees to come back. I think it's for seven years in Iowa. Uh, and so, you know, she's matching uh, to, a, to a, hopefully a surgery residency uh, coming up here in a couple of months. But we already have folks seeking out students in their fourth year to pay off their debt. Um, core rotation sites. Uh, well, let me, before I go to that, match rate. Match rate is a very important thing as well. What is the match rate? It's, the goal is not to just 
graduate from medical school. The goal is to actually match the residency and internship so that you can get enough money eventually when you become a full-fledged doctor, residency trained board certified to pay off your loans and treat patients. Match is how many of the students graduated matched to an internship and residency. Again, the benchmark in the country is 95%. The average is 97%. Uh, we were at 100% last year. Uh, and so those are the things that you want to look for. If somebody's less than 95%, that's a red flag. Core rotation sites, where do they do their rotations? Some, some schools do it just locally, usually in big cities. Uh, Chicago, all the students rotate locally. That's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that they don't have to travel very far. Uh, it's a bad thing in that if nine of you want to do ophthalmology and there's only one ophthalmology slot in Chicago, you're, not doing, you're all competing for it. We have our core rotation sites in, Angela, help me, 32 cities now? 30, uh, so we, we do core rotation sites in Columbus, Ohio, and Cleveland, Ohio, and Michigan, and Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and Florida, and et cetera. Uh, and that makes it hard for us in some ways in that we, I have to send an assistant dean to visit all of those sites and do checklists on quality, et cetera, to make sure the quality of the rotations is up. Uh, but also, it helps the students, though, in that I'll give you an example. Let's, Brian, you know, you want to go into ophthalmology. If Brian wants to go into ophthalmology and he goes to Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State has ophthalmology, uh, Grandview has ophthalmology, or, or Grant, rather, uh, you know, Riverside has ophthalmology. So there's like four hospitals there that have the op ophthalmology. So if you're rotating in that city and you rotate through those hospitals, the chances of you matching in ophthalmology, much higher. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons we have them all over the place. I'll speed up because I know I'm running out of time. That's why Angela's looking at me with concern. Uh, a curriculum, you know, as we talked about, what are the curriculum changes that are going to occur? Are they updating their curriculum constantly? Um, a good example is like ultrasound. Ultrasound's now a bedside tool. You, you know, you see ultrasound in, in ortho and OB-GYN and ER and family practice looking at, you, you, it's almost ubiquitous. It's almost like the stethoscope these days. Do they include ultrasound in the curriculum? The answer is yes. Uh, starting in the fall, it goes into anatomy and several other places, and eventually we'll incorporate it in OMM as well. Um, and then the reputation, you know, obviously the reputation. If people see that this student is from X school, do they think, oh my gosh, no, or do they think yes? I'll go faster on this one. Surviving medical school, as we talked about, volume, time management, building blocks, integrity. This is a big one for me. I will tell you, although the students will tell you that I'm probably the most approachable dean that you'll ever meet, I'm also a hard ass in that if you cheat or if you steal, you're out. Um, and it's not like in years past where you got put on probation, et cetera. I view, quite frankly, all of my students as would I want to see them over top of my wife or child after they graduate. And so I've probably tossed out more people than any other dean. Uh, if they've cheated or if they've stolen or if they've had a lack of integrity, they're gone, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, 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 no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just the way it is. Uh, and so... Um, you know, we've had folks and I've had people call, but my dad's a surgeon at so-and-so. Well, great. Maybe he can get you a job at the McDonald's across the street because you're not going to be a doctor at my medical school. Um, wellness. We're big on wellness. They want you to be, you know, they, they, we want you in the gym. And if I don't see you in the gym, uh, then I will say something to you as well. If, if, you know, it's, it's nice that you are always hitting the books, but I also want to see you in the gym. The dean's in the gym. Uh, now, everybody makes fun of me because I have to wear my bifocals in the gym to see what weights I'm putting on. Uh, and the smart aleck last week who said, where's the AED, Dr. Polk's in here. Uh, yeah, so they, they do recognize when I'm in there. Um, you know, involvement, we have a lot of volunteer hours, as I said. Support from family and friends, also very important. Uh, this is the malpractice bowl picture. We actually have a a very collegiate game of football that we play against the Drake Law School. Um, so it's the DMU Medical School versus the Drake Law School. We always come up with interesting shirts to wear, not necessarily politically correct, uh, to disparage the other team. Uh, the one that our folks had this last year said, is there a lawyer in the house? Said nobody ever. Uh, and so... <clears throat> yeah. 
couple things just to remind you. Uh, big numbers that you need to hold on to, you know, like the 98% first-time pass rate, uh, 62% is how many people go into primary care, 100% is the match rate, um, third tier as far as the expense, et cetera. Uh, 35, those are our clinical sites, uh, core sites, and then 40 are the number of countries that we go to for global health. You can do a rotation in your fourth year to 40 different countries. And speaking of global health, we are one of the only medical schools. In fact, we were the first initially to have the agreement with uh, the World Health Organization. We send two students, uh, typically between their second and third year, uh, it's fairly competitive to, to get to do it, but we send two students to Geneva, Switzerland, to learn uh, world health policy and to do health policy. And, you know, I was worried about passing biochem when I was in medical school. I, I didn't ever have the thought or opportunity to go to Geneva, Switzerland, and work on global health policy for two months. But we have that. We also have rotations at the CDC and Centers for Disease Control. That's where one of the few medical schools other than Emory uh, that has that as well. And, of course, we do a lot of global health trips as well. Uh, research, we do a lot of research here. In fact, uh, we've increased the number of grants and research by 77% in the last two years. Uh, we've got a, a huge research portfolio. Uh, unfortunately, we're being so successful at it, we're running out of room. Uh, we are going to have to expand our facilities eventually. We, we, we're at max on the animal care facility right now. Uh, we've got a lot of good faculty doing a lot of interesting research. Uh, the one on the left, the far left bottom, I have to tell you about. We've got uh, several anthropologists that are in the anatomy program. They, uh, uh, I was worried as the dean because one of the things they did, they got a big, uh, you know, NSF grant, which is hard to get. First of all, to get the, the national grants right now in this current climate. But they got a grant to go look at DNA in this Paleozoic cave. It was a blind cave that the animals would fall off this cliff and go plunking down into this cave for tens of thousands of years. And so this cave, 60 foot down, had all of this DNA from animals for you know, 100,000 or more years. Uh, and so they, were, they rappelled down into this cave to get the DNA to look at changes in the DNA and certain animal structures with climate change. And so... My worry from the dean, of course, is you know, none of them were repellers. They had to go take repelling lessons. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure they can get down. The problem is getting up. You know, I, I, for those of you, if any of you have ever repelled, and I have done so in the military, the going down thing, you know, it's scary for you because you're, you're holding on, you're repelling down. That's not the bad part. The bad part is going up and trying to figure out how to pull yourself up and pull your body weight up especially if you're hauling DNA samples and bones and other things. Uh, but fortunately, they got through it. I was trying to figure out how I was going to write that down in workman's comp, uh, but fortunately, didn't have to. As we talked about, how did they do a clinical integration? We have a huge Simmons ball, which you'll see on the tour tonight. Uh, you know, as we talked about with ultrasound and with the clinical rotations, there are a lot of things that we are incorporating. Uh, I, if I, I want you to make mistakes, but I want you to make them in the Simmons ball lab. I don't want you to make them on Mrs. Johnson or my wife or my kids. And so we'll do a lot of these things ahead of time. And then for my strategic plan is really easy. We're, we're increasing Iowa GME or residencies in Iowa. We're, we're innovating new and different osteopathic education, whether it's incorporation of ultrasound, whether it's incorporation of things like quality of care, uh, preventive medicine, et cetera, into the curriculum. Uh, and we have a lot. The students are great leaders. We have uh, leadership courses and integrated leadership uh, here as well. And so I don't want them to just be primary care physicians. Instead, I want them to be leaders in whatever they do. Uh, and so that's, that's it from my standpoint. I think I was just a little bit over. But that's good for me, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Welcome. It's, uh, it's an honor to be asked to talk with you guys. I'm Drew Lewis. I'm uh, one of the professors in the OMM department, Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine or Manual Medicine, depending on the school. Some places call it OPP, Osteopathic Principles and Practice. Um, I was a graduate from here in 2003. I uh, came from Seattle originally, went to University of Puget Sound. If anybody's from that far away, it'd be a long trip to come out for open house. And I uh, was just curious, getting started here, uh, how many people have been treated by a DO? Um, raise of hands. 
Great. So, so people that have had seen a DO as their physician. And how many people have had OMM or manipulation from a DO? Smaller group of hands. Great. Excellent. Well, I was invited here to talk just briefly about uh, OMM or one of, one of the aspects that make osteopathic physicians uh, different from our allopathic counterparts. Uh, here we have a, a picture of our department. I guess I'm one of the, the middle faculty members, and we have some uh, newer hires. Dr. Crowton Heineman were graduates from here, and our, our three uh, more experienced physicians on the right side, um, the ones that taught me, uh, uh, Dr. Figueroa is here with us as well. Uh, all of us are graduates from Des Moines University with varied backgrounds, uh, family practice members, OMM specialists. Dr. Figueroa and myself are physical medicine rehab residency trained doctors who use a lot of OMM in our practice. This is just a, a really brief, again, this is going to be a pretty succinct uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, very briefly going to talk about the history of osteopathy, how we, we look at incorporating this into medicine and medical practice, and uh, kind of the big picture. This is from the AOA website. Osteopathic medicine is a complete system of medical care. The philosophy is to treat the whole person, not just the symptoms. There we go. It emphasizes the interrelationships of structure and function and the appreciation of the body's ability to heal itself. So stepping back to our origins here, we have a nice picture of A.T. Still. A.T. Still was an MD, and at the time uh, that he was practicing, he became disillusioned with mainstream medicine. Uh, he had lost three of his children and his father to infectious diseases, which were incurable at the time. They were giving... Different, different quote-unquote treatments, uh, mercury and um, uh, just all sorts of you know, things that, that we nowadays we would consider toxic to try to cure things because they just didn't have the science and, and uh, the, the advances that we have now. And going through this, he, he was a very religious man. His father was a, a preacher. Uh, he believed that God created man with the potential for perfection and that the physician should use reason and understanding of nature's laws as the keys to health and disease. Beliefs were based on his conceptualization of humankind as self-sustaining and strengthened by successful outcomes of testing those beliefs with patients. And he postulated an approach to the patient that gave real focus to the musculoskeletal system in both diagnosis and treatment. And here's a great classic picture of him looking at a bone. And there's all sorts of cool stories about how well he, he learned uh, the bones. Again, our, our term osteopathy has to do with the finding pathology in the position of the bones. Here we see one of the first schools, just a, you know, really kind of a shack uh, down in Kirksville, Missouri. That's where, where it all started. And uh, found, founding of the school in 1892. Our school here, I believe, was founded in 1898. So it was the second osteopathic school in the country and has uh, been here for quite a while. These are the six key principles uh, of osteopathic medicine, and uh, it's not to say that these are unique to osteopathic medicine. Uh, allopathic schools may, may be incorporating these more and more, I would, I would guess. The body functions as a unit. It all works together. The body possesses self-regulatory mechanisms. This is, I think everybody would agree with that. The body, excuse me, the movement of body fluids is essential to the maintenance of health. This is a really big one for osteopaths. We really try to make sure that, that respiration and circulation are optimized to all the tissues, and we can use our OMM to try to help with that. If, if there's the, the position of a bone is, is restricted or is interfering with circulation or respiration, uh, that can lead to disease states. And uh, restoring that, that motion or, or moving a bone a little bit can sometimes be very helpful for getting a patient back towards health. The body has an inherent capacity to heal and repair itself. And again, this is, this is part of that, that philosophy that still had that our bodies are made to heal themselves. Our bodies are made to work well. Life, trauma, experiences sometimes get in the way with that. Um, but uh, our goal as physicians is, is really to try to help potentiate health, help find health. Structure and function are interrelated. Here we have a quote. Disease is the result of anatomical abnormalities followed by physiologic discord. Uh, and what we mean by structure and function are interrelated. 
the position, the structure of that, that musculoskeletal system really has a lot to do with how the body is functioning. If you have a restriction in the rib cage and the bones, if they're, they're restricted and, and not allowing you to take deep breaths in and out, it's going to affect the function of the rib cage, helping with inhalation. And uh, anybody who's worked in a hospital setting knows that if patients aren't breathing well and getting good inhalation, exhalation, etc., they're at a setup to develop a pneumonia from, from lack of, of the, the, the lungs fully uh, inspiring and expiring. So again, the, the structure can really affect the function of our bodies. And finally, six here, somatic components to disease are not only manifestations of disease, but are also factors that contribute to the maintenance of the disease state. And that's, uh, again, these, these last ones are, are probably more the, the aspects of the philosophy that, that really tend to differ from some of the more progressive uh, allopathic schools. Again, some of the top ones, I think a lot of physicians can... can completely buy in with that. The ones that, that really separate osteopathy as we're looking down at four, five, and, and especially six. So what we mean by somatic components, and we're gonna give you a definition of that, structural issues, restrictions of motion of bones, of, of uh, soft tissues, muscles, ligaments, joints, etc., cetera, uh, not only may come from disease states, but may also contribute to. And, and again, that, that example of uh, a rib that's perhaps preventing the, the uh, full rib cage with full inhalation and exhalation could contribute or even potentially uh, cause uh, a, a patient to develop something like pneumonia. So it's our philosophy and our focus on treating the body manually, which distinguishes us from mainstream or allopathic medicine. And again, with an appreciation of Still's key principles, the osteopathic physician's approach to treating is distinct. An osteopath can use OMT, osteopathic manual uh, treatment to identify and treat related somatic components or areas of somatic dysfunction. We focus our own T particularly on the neuromusculoskeletal system uh, and the interdependent interactions which are specifically related to structure and function. So there are some techniques where we might focus on a particular visceral organ, but again, osteopathy was based on the, the position of the bone has significant effect on uh, disease states either causing or contributing and we're typically looking at that musculoskeletal system, both for diagnostic clues about disease, finding issues, uh, for instance, in the paraspinal muscles may, may clue us in that, that somebody has something going on viscerally with an organ system. Somebody with appendicitis might have tight muscles down near the lower rib cage area, in this T12 area, for instance. Uh, so we can use our evaluation, our knowledge of somatic dysfunction to help with diagnosis. Uh, and somebody who's had a uh, gallbladder problem, they end up getting their gallbladder removed, they may still have some somatic dysfunction or tight muscles in the paraspinals in the middle back, the T6 to 9, for instance. And it's fairly common that patients may still have their same gallbladder pain, pain in the, in the mid back to the right shoulder, uh, etc., even after that, that organ is removed. So if we can treat the... the um, somatic relationship or the somatic findings, the somatic dysfunction that was related to the gallbladder, we can hopefully help to completely erase the body's memory of that pathology. Somatic dysfunctions, now we have the definition impaired or altered function of the somatic body framework component of the musculoskeletal system, including articular or joint, periarticular around the joints, myofascial muscle and fascia is another Fancier term for connective tissue, the, the stuff you see when you're, you're eating meat. Vascular and neural components and elements, the, the blood and the, uh, and the nervous system. So what causes this? Macro traumas and micro traumas. And by trauma, we don't necessarily mean somebody falling like we see in some of these big macro traumas. Excuse me, major illness could be a macro trauma to your, to your body. Uh, major surgery, giving birth, being born could be a traumatic experience. And microtraumas, these, these are things that happen to us on a daily basis. Uh, studying in medical school for eight to 12 hours a day in a seated position, staring at a laptop computer, not necessarily great for your body. Those are, those are potential microtraumas uh, and stress and, and all sorts of things. So any of these things can potentially cause somatic dysfunction. 
who get stomach dysfunctions, normally our bodies have a great potential to, to uh, compensate for these daily occurrences. Uh, but it's when our bodies have lost that ability to compensate, when life just sort of overwhelms our, our abilities, uh, is when we tend to start developing somatic dysfunction. So really everybody's susceptible. The host plus disease equals illness is, uh, is a really neat model to help, I think, explain what it is we're talking about with osteopathic medicine. This is something uh, Dr. Stiles, who, who is a, a professor and been teaching for many years, uh, is still with us. Uh, and as far as I know, he came up with this. And so what we're talking about is viewing the clinical presentation or illness, what the patient comes into the office with as a combination of factors. And it's not just a disease. Um, the disease is almost always combined with the somatic dysfunction in the host. And it's the disease plus the host's response to it that forms that complete clinical presentation or illness. So patient with, let's say, shortness of breath, this is the patient, how they might present to the, to the clinic, to the hospital, uh, if they need to be admitted, etc. That's going to be a combination. The disease could be pneumonia, asthma, uh, upper back pain. We just have some other things thrown up here. Upper back pain, heart failure, congestive heart failure. Pretty common for patients to be admitted to hospital with some of these diagnoses causing shortness of breath. And there are many different treatments uh, that, that could be utilized depending on what they're coming in with. Just some lists here. Medications, surgery, injections, rehabilitation, all sorts of different ways to focus a treatment at disease. The host's response would be the somatic dysfunctions that are associated with that patient's clinical presentation. Uh, they, <clears throat> the example here, T5. This would be a vertebral somatic dysfunction and just the nomenclature that we might use for that. The, the T5 vertebra perhaps is rotated a little bit, causing some restriction. Uh, could be even affecting our autonomic nervous system. And uh, that, some of that's a whole other lecture. But uh, the, the host would be the, the somatic dysfunctions that are present in that patient's body. We would treat that with OMT. So again, the illness or the patient's presentation is a combination of these things. If you have a medical student with pneumonia, a walking pneumonia or, or you know, any, any type of pneumonia, uh, they may do just fine. They may get an antibiotic for that. They probably are going to do just fine. You have a patient in a nursing home uh, who is essentially bedridden that develops pneumonia. They may pass away from that pneumonia despite appropriate antibiotic treatment. So uh, the disease, excuse me, the illness state really depends on uh, the disease in a host, right, and how that host responds to that disease. So our, our goal with OMT is to really try and fight off disease by, by maximizing uh, the host and, and treating the somatic dysfunctions we find. Just looking at this, uh, what type of providers really focus on disease? What kind of providers can do these things down here? Anybody? MDs, right? And DOs. DOs can do all sorts of surgeries and prescribe medications. And some mid-levels, nurse practitioners now, and, and uh, PAs, physician assistants. Who, does, who, who focuses on the host? What type of people can treat the musculoskeletal system? DOs. Who else? PTs, yeah. Some P, all PTs get involved with you know, stretching and strengthening, and, and some PTs even do a lot of manual therapy. Not manual treatment, manual therapy. Chiropractors. Chiropractic is all focused on the host, right? They're not allowed. They don't have a scope of practice which allows them to do surgery or prescribe medications. They, they get x-rays and they do a lot of treatments. Uh, so this is the difference. DOs are the only group of practitioners that can do both. Treat the host and treat the disease to maximize the treatment of that patient's illness. So here, if we look at some different options, if the primary issue with a patient is disease, let's say they, they have a urinary tract infection, uh, uncomplicated, well, medical treatment and an antibiotic is probably going to be very successful. If the primary issue is with the host, the usual medical care may be unsuccessful and providing OMT, treating that patient with our hands, can be beneficial and oftentimes dramatic. And sometimes the, it's, it's a both. It's a combined issue. The medical care may be helpful, but it might not produce the expected clinical outcome. And the addition of OMT hopefully helps enable the patient to realize their health potential. 
Any questions on that? We have a quote from one of my good friends, colleagues here, Dr. Figueroa. Osteopathic, excuse me, osteopathic physicians and some MDs who are trained in OMT can treat both aspects of the patient's illness in cases where regular allopathic treatments alone could not help the patient reach full recovery. Just to the last, last couple of slides here. So as DOs, we can do it all, right? That's our rah-rah statement. I may have come up with that, trademark. Some of our goals with OMT restore normal range of motion, strengthen weak or stretch tight muscles to further improve muscular balance. It's a big deal, with, with, uh, especially with patients with pain issues. Improve organ and or somatic function. Uh, we can focus treatments in ways that we can may perhaps try and stimulate or inhibit uh, the, the nerve centers, uh, particularly the autonomic nervous system. This is our sympathetic nerves, our fight or flight nerves, or our parasympathetic, our you know, I'm going to eat a big meal and digest and relax and so forth, our parasympathetic nervous systems. There are ways to focus your treatments to try and uh, improve the way those are, and balance in particular, the way those are working. And especially improve blood supply and increase venous and lymphatic drainage. That's a huge, we feel that's a huge component of health, making sure there's adequate circulation and respiration of the tissues, not just respiration of, of our, our chest moving, but getting the oxygen to the tissues that may be damaged or injured, getting good blood flow down there, improving drainage. If you have a big, big old ankle sprain down there and it's really swollen, you want to help get some of that, that old blood out of there so new blood can come in and, and help heal that area. And here's the big picture. It's our philosophy and our focus on treating the body manually, which distinguishes the osteopathic from mainstream or allopathic medicine. The training is parallel but distinct. The scope of practice, again, is, is exactly what MDs can do in terms of surgeries, prescribing medicine, ordering tests, etc. But we also are able to provide uh, further diagnostic evaluations with our hands and treatments with our hands to, to, again, hopefully help potentiate that patient's health. DOs work in all fields of medicine and have residency positions in all fields. And a lot of our DO graduates end up training alongside MDs in allopathic institutions, for good or for bad. Uh, I did my residency at UC Davis in Sacramento, California, which is an allopathic institution, and trained with wonder wonderful MDs. And I had one uh, DO attending, um, and he was great as well. So, so again, there, there's a wide variety of options that are available once you graduate and, and hopefully match into the field you're, you're wanting to go into. And not all DOs manipulate. There are certain fields where it's really probably not appropriate to manipulate if you're a pathologist, right? If you're a coroner. It's, it's not, you're probably not going to manipulate if you're going into radiology. Uh, and, and again, there's you know, maybe a few others that are like that. But the potential to use manipulation, especially going into any sort of primary care field, going into OB-GYN, going into surgery, you know, getting a patient to start, use the phrase, start having gas and Pooping is how they typically help get patients out of the hospital and keep them from getting other, other illnesses and, and uh, the pneumonias and the, the clots in the legs, etc. Uh, and there are simple things that we can do after surgery to try to help that process. So just such a wonderful, wonderful tool that we have to treat with. All right, so we are going to just do a little brief demonstration. And... Uh, <laughs> I have uh, my colleague here, future colleague. Jake is one of our senior medical students. He's an OMM fellow. Um, so he's a, essentially a fifth-year student, a pre-graduate fellow who's working in our department, seeing patients uh, half of the day and helping us teach students half of the day. And, and volunteering at night. And volunteering at night, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want a demo or you want me to demo. Go Doesn't for it. I already took my shoes off, man. All right. He's ready. All right. <laughs> so, um, you know, we really uh, are, are just going to show you a couple couple simple things. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways to treat. When I'm working with – I see patients half of the day in the morning, just like I mentioned with Jake, and then in the afternoons typically I'm working with our students in lectures and labs or, or testing students, et cetera. And um, when I'm seeing a patient, uh, there – 
there oftentimes is this thought in my head, do I need to try and maybe release some tension in muscles, myofascial tension, and approach it that way? Or do I think that a joint needs to pop? Do I need to, to articulate a joint? Uh, and I think everybody might have a concept of that. Some people pop their own, their own bodies uh, or self-manipulate or have been treated by others that do that. So if I find a restriction, I I'm oftentimes wonder, do I, do I need to maybe stretch this or do something else to release tension? Or perhaps is there a, a joint restriction that we just need to get it to move? So an example of uh, a myofascial approach, and there's a couple different ways to do this. If we're just looking at tension in the hamstrings, this can be really important for issues like knee pain, hip pain, low back pain, etc. If we look for the tension in his hamstring here, we can see that Jake doesn't get too far with this right knee extension. When the hamstring's tight, it's going to tend to limit that. One way to treat that, uh, you know, kind of a typical uh, approach might be to stretch it. You know, pro, you know, we can all stretch at home. I could do some stretching type work. We could use a, a really nice simple technique that we call muscle energy, where we go up to that barrier again, and we just have Jake pull down, contract the muscles. There's something called post-isometric relaxation, where once he relaxes, we can take that a little further to the next barrier. And we may do this to three to four barriers. It's one way to, to help trick the muscle into relaxing by engaging it. But that'd be a direct way to do this. We're actually taking him to new barriers. We're directly uh, attempting to lengthen that muscle. Another way to do this would be to look for a strain pattern or, or uh, tension in the muscle. You know, we have three, three muscles here with our hamstrings. Those are, those are tender. So looking here at the medial side, we have the semimembranosus and semitendinosus tendons that come down to the medial knee. And if I find an area that's tight or tender or both, and it clearly looked tender to Jake, we can flex the knee. So we're kind of doing the opposite of stretching. This would be an indirect myofascial type technique and put him in a position where it feels softer and less tender when I poke on him. And if we hold this here, sometimes this will release. It might take five to 10 seconds. It might take even up to 90 seconds. This type of technique we will call strain counter strain. And I won't quiz you on that later. But uh, this would be an indirect way to treat, a very gentle way to treat. He's completely relaxed or, or as relaxed as possible. And we are shortening that muscle as opposed to stretching it. And hopefully, if we can get it to release, again, it may take up to 90 seconds. Uh, and I didn't hold him that long. Then when we recheck, we're hoping that it's, that it's easier to extend him. So that would be an example of how we can use different techniques, um, particularly to lengthen, tighten, or shorten muscles. Should we show you how to pop something or what it looks like? Can you sit up and face them? Have you had this treated recently? No. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to use my hands here, kind of sweep down his posterior rib cage and look for some prominent rib <laughs> angles that when, when the ribs are sticking out a little bit, a little bit restricted posteriorly, they're oftentimes pretty tender on this rib angle, the prominent part of the rib here, just lateral to the spine. So on this left side, at this one more or this one? Or both? I'd say posterior fourth and fifth rib uh, are prominent and tender. So I have you laying your back. These are st typically structural rib issues as, as opposed to maybe more of a respiratory. Can you scoot a little closer to me? Yeah. Normally, uh, my table in my office goes up or down really nice with buttons and so forth. Like all the, like all the tables in labs, the students will tell you. Uh, so this is a little bit higher. Normally, I have the table at about the high of my knee. So I'll try and get over the top here. This is, this is the tables we had when I was in school here. And they had little lifts for the shorter folks. <laughs> you know, if your heart stops, I'll just push on that rib. Yeah. Deep breath in for me. And out. Oh, and it just went. <laughs> Cheap date. <laughs> I don't know if you guys could hear that pop through the microphone, but there was a nice little pop, pop, pop. Let me have you sit up and face away from me again. And so, of course, you always want to recheck. And uh, the ribs don't feel as prominent 
Now, there may still be some tenderness if I really dig in on him, but yeah. good. <laughs> so that's, that's one way to articulate a rib and, and uh, free up that joint restriction where that rib meets the, the vertebra uh, can be a little bit restricted and kind of hold that back. Do you guys have any questions on anything that I talked about today, the demonstration, how awesome DMU is, anything? <laughs> Besides yeah. that causing him pain, what else could have been the problem with him having the rib what, issues? What could have caused it what? or what could it cause? Could it cause? Oh, a posterior rib. Unfortunately, these are fairly common and, um, and we don't always know what causes it. Um, it can be caused by just picking up something abnormal or sitting with a posture where you're slumped for a long time. It, sometimes the, a poor posture might cause this. Um, but what it could cause, if that rib is sticking out posteriorly, and it's just medial, just inside to the uh, scapula, the shoulder blade. Can you turn around, Jane? Yeah. Just inside the shoulder blade here. Where we were looking was right in this area. And so we're just inside where the shoulder blade is. And the shoulder blade, the shoulder is going to uh, glide over that posterior rib cage. If the rib is sticking out a little bit and it's tender, he may not want to move his shoulder normally. He may tend to hold that shoulder protracted or more forward. And, and shoulders forward is a fairly common position for people that work at desk jobs with computers and don't always pay attention to their posture. And that can then lead to problems with the rotator cuff. Excuse me. These four muscles and tendons that form the rotator cuff are meant to work with the shoulder in a nice neutral position like so. If the shoulder is really tethered forward, you're really asking that tiny little muscle to work when it's been twisted and pulled forward into an awkward position. They may develop rotator cuff problems, posterior rib pain. Um, if it hurts really bad, you might not want to take deep breaths in. And uh, so any number of things that are really easy to try and prevent. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to chat with you. My name is Ben Resny. I'm a third year medical student, so I'm on clinical rotations right now, and I can speak to that side of things. Plus, I'm a non-traditional. Um, I had a career for 10 years before I went to medical school. So I started medical school at, at uh, 30 years old. So if anybody's non-traditional, I'll be glad to elaborate on that. Um, I'm Molly Paris. I'm a second year student, um, originally from the Chicago area. Um, a little bit non-traditional as well. Um, I did a little bit of extra schooling before coming here. I got a master's degree and just done on academics to strengthen my background before, um, before. I'm Samantha Banzer. I'm a second year medical student as well. I'm from a small town, Janesville, Iowa, and I'm kind of, if you have questions about rural medicine, um, anything like that, that's my pathway and my area of interest. To the, so that's about it. How do you balance your personal and professional life? Um, I was just talking about this a little bit, and I'll, my thought on this, honestly, is um, it's very hard, but I guess my answer is you have to do it. Like, you have to make time for your other things, for your professional life, for your families, for your hobbies. Um, that's my personal take on it. You just have to make time for it. If you... We're obviously in school and we're very busy, but unless you make time to do something, you know, to have something that's not just studying, you will go insane. <laughs> um, so taking a little bit of time, you know, go work out, go sit outside, go watch a TV show, um, you can get it done. And just spending a little bit of time for yourself or for your family or anything can go a really long way. Um, I think I, I agree with what Liz said, and I, I think that being comfortable cutting yourself off at a certain time in the evening is really important, um, and realizing that while there is a lot of material to get through, um, you'll burn out very quickly if you stay up all night every night. Or um, You have to set boundaries for yourself and trust that you will be able to get through the material and learn without sacrificing your own 
health and well-being. That's really important. Um, I think something that our our professors in the school really try to impress upon us is that if we don't take care of ourselves, how can we take care of other people? Um, so there's a lot of wellness programming and um, you know a lot of opportunities to learn how important it is to balance school with everything. What do you do for fun to get away from studying? I'm probably the worst person to answer this question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to. No, I actually, uh, I have I watch Netflix every single night. I make sure I do that. Uh, right now it's Dr. Pohl, the animal vet, because it's kind of related to medicine. But no, you do have to do something like TV or find a hobby like we spoke about. I'm not going to go into length about it because we just kind of spoke to it. But does anybody else have anything particular that... I like cooking too, but there's a lot of cool stuff to do around the area, so it's fun. I get a little pamphlet in the mail at my apartment with uh, the stuff that goes on, so I just look through that at the beginning of the month, and with my friends, I just plan out stuff to do. Um, but otherwise, I like to be outside, and there's a lot of outside activities, which is nice, um, as well as just hanging out with friends. Um. Um, so the next question is, why did you choose DO instead of MD? Do you want to discuss that? I can take I can go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I chose DO instead of MD was just the feeling I got. I applied to uh, both programs and was accepted at different programs in uh, different areas. And uh, it wasn't really a DO versus MD thing. It was when I got to Des Moines University here. And this is not an, I guess it's not an advertisement for this place. I want you to go where you're happy. But you need to find where you fit in. And if you're concerned about um, the letters behind your name and what they mean or what they say, then you go with what your heart desires. But in, the, in practice, where I'm at now in the clinic, I, I can't tell you if I'm working under a DO or an MD as a preceptor. Uh, a lot of the differences in a bad way are overplayed on the internet or on different forums or different things you might see. In the real world, um, it's much, much nicer uh, agreement that I find out there at least. So for me, it was more the institution more than what was behind my name because I really didn't care. I just wanted to take care of patients and I felt most comfortable learning that here. I was accepted. I, I was accepted at both uh, MD and DO schools, and my choice was to become a DO, a conscious choice, because I felt that I want to become a doctor where I would be the most prepared to take care of the patients the way I want to take care of them. I always saw medicine as the whole person, not a disease. I saw medicine as something where we not only treat the disease and bring them to the zero line baseline. I saw medicine as the venue to bring them above the zero line, to get them to health, to maximum health, maximum functionality, however stage they're in right now. And to me, uh, a doctor of osteopathic medicine was the best way to achieve that. And Des Moines University, uh, one of the number of osteopathic schools that gave me an acceptance, was the best place, like Ben said, where I fit in. I was cared for, and I have always felt part of a very, very large 220-people family. <laughs> so, thank you. I do have a family. I came here to medical school with a family. I have a wife and two children, and um, balance is more than achievable. If you have a significant other, it is about planning. It is about how well you are prepared to maintain that balance. It is not just about you. It is about your family. Never forget about it. And I personally, this is my personal choice, usually from 6 to 9, except today, I am a dad. And I do ask permission from my children and my wife to go if I have to do something like this. You know, their opinion matters. They are part of my life. This is a place for holistic medicine. 
and I view myself, and school lets me be holistic. They treat me holistically. They know I have a family. The school does everything. We have a spousal support group for boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, and wives. Uh, my wife participates in it. They have a baby exchange for those who don't have children. They have um, essentially date nights, various activities, book clubs. So your family is not alone. The worst feeling ever is when your significant other is not in a medical school and they feel completely isolated and they're alone. Your significant others are never going to be alone. You know, um, and your children are not going to be alone either. We have kids' events uh, with uh, staff children, uh, with uh, fellow students' children. My kids go to play with multiple play groups from both DPM and DO programs. For you specifically, just. <laughs> Apparently. So uh, the question is, what can your family do to support you as you work your way through medical school? So uh, for those who don't have spouses and it's the parents supporting them, I'll let them answer. Uh, my wife keeps track of my schedule. My, and this is, uh, this is the reality of life. I have my life scheduled. I am being told when to go. And I honestly do go because that's uh, that's the only way I can actually yeah, yes interact with my kids. Uh, I my life is guided by my cell phone. <laughs> my cell phone has my schedule on it, and um, they can understand. Ask their input before you go into medical school, because if they don't want it, you have a problem on your hands. Convince them. My wife did not want me to do it. It took, honestly, good two years of convincing. And I was accepted here after she agreed that, yes, we're going to go through this as a family. They support you because you have bad days. So when you have bad days, ask your significant others to understand you. You might be grumpy. You might be very angry. You might be crying. They just need to... Honestly, on those days, take care of you. And please remember that they did take care of you and take care of them back. Anytime you borrow from your family when you are a medical student, anytime you borrow from your parents, from your boyfriends, girlfriends, children, give it back, please. Because you don't want to come out of it alone. So for me, I FaceTime my parents every single night, <laughs> um, especially like after exams. Like if you don't do well on an exam, like I have to talk to my parents because they always, they always, they're like, it's okay, Ria. Like it's just one exam, you know, it's like a marathon, not a sprint. Like I always feel so much better after I talk to my parents. And like night before exams, I may not talk to them if I'm like cramming and whatnot. And they'll usually text me like, are you Okay. But I, I try to, even if it's like five or ten minutes, for me it feels really nice. I even did it in undergrad, so I guess it's like a habit that carried over. So that's what, like, I have to talk to them every night. Uh, so the question is, advice for a prospective student, what do you wish you would have known? Um, I have to think about it first. Hmm. <laughs> what would you wish you have known? I think there is the easiest answer. I wish I would have known they're not lying about the drinking from the fire hydrant. Yeah. Every single, I, I will admit, I was like, oh, no, I can do it. I got it. A fire hydrant is, you know, is just a metaphor. No, it's it's a high reality. I wish I wish I knew that that this is realistic. This is hard. This is completely doable. Every single person here is smart enough to do it. You know, you just really gotta want it, and it will be hard. And don't don't despair when it is hard. I would say more on that. The same thing that I I knew it was gonna be hard, but you just you know. I'm a smart person, I can handle it, and you can, like Nick said, you definitely can handle it, but it is har way harder than I ever thought it was going to be, honestly. Um, 
it ended up being harder for me. It was a struggle. The first few months were a, a very significant struggle. But you just have to take it one day at a time, and you have to look around, know that you can do it, and know that every, all your classmates are doing it with you. You know, you're all doing it. You're all, you can all do it. You're going to get through it. But it's hard. The other question was, what advice do you have for students currently in the interview process? Um, okay, one of the things that I would like to say is, um, if you're going to go through the interview process, do not make it a cookie cutter thing that you think they want you to hear. Please be yourself, because that's what's really going to set you apart. I have come across a lot of people who, you know, sometimes at, at certain interviews, they would tell me about themselves, and I was like, you know, this seems like a very generic response that, that they, you know, especially in group interviews, you hear these and you and you can kind of identify already that th these are not really very real responses. They're just very cookie cutter things that make them seem like automatons who study all day, you know, who do good and volunteer activities. You really want to show them what is special about you. So be true to yourself. You know, um, that's that's one of the things that I think that I think you should. You should always do is just be true about yourself, uh, be passionate, and show that passion. Um, don't let them. Don't always fall into that pit hole of thinking that you should give them what they want to hear. The other basic advice I would give you, and this is just practical, the day before your interviews, get arrive early the day before and drive to where you're supposed to be going for your interview and know where everything's at. So when you get to that day, you're not upset and you're not running around and sweating from trying to get there, and you can be relaxed because, like, like they were saying, the biggest thing you can do is be true to who you are, and when you're all frazzled and trying to maintain your composure because you were trying to figure out where the interview room is, it's difficult to relax from the start. So if you could just be relaxed from the second you walk in the door, you'll typically interview uh, much better. I thing I also think is really, that's really important is to um, do your research. And, and obviously, a lot of you in here have done that because you're here tonight learning about the school. Um, but be familiar with the school website and, and what's there, and be prepared to ask questions. Um, something that they make a very big deal about on interview day is that process is not just about the school interviewing you, it's about you interviewing the school to see if it's a fit for you. And at the end of the day, the school you need to choose is the one where you feel that you fit in the most and the one where you feel the most comfortable. Um, so make sure that you ask questions to really learn if it's the best fit for you. How did you transition from undergraduate to medical school, and what campus resources exist to help? Um, my transition was a little bit different. Um, I applied to medical school my senior year of college and didn't get in and realized that I needed to spend a little more time making sure that it was what I really wanted and figuring out how to make it happen. Um, so I actually went to graduate school. Um, I got a master's degree in biomedical sciences, and for me, that was a really great route. It was a good way for me to become more familiar with a heavier volume of material that was more science-based than my undergraduate curriculum. So for me, I felt that that really prepared me, um, but I think that's a, a different thing for every person. Um, I think what's really important about the transition to medical school is learning how to be flexible and to adapt your habits, especially your study habits. Um, a lot of us found when we got here that the way we studied as undergraduates um, didn't work anymore for the type of material that we have here and the way that we're learning it. And so it's important to be open to um, trying different study methods and, and realize it's, that it's a bit of trial and error in the first few months to figure out what works for you. And I think the people who really have succeeded are the people who are um, willing to be flexible and try different things until they find something that really works for them. The, the first year that you come here, they have um, big sibs, so that's a second year student that you get paired with to kind of get some advice on what medical school is like and to have someone when you come because your transition is not only from undergrad to medical school, it's also from wherever you lived to here now. And your friends from undergrad or your support system there isn't immediately with you like they were. So you have to build that support system as well. So getting a second year student, and then we have um, a peer support group 
uh, it's called stress management, but really all it is is it's two second years that gets paired with six first years or eight first years, depending on the group. And you meet and you talk through classes and they give you advice on certain professors and what they like to test on or what they heavily emphasize or how to succeed, um, some different mechanisms to use with coping with stress. And we have counselors on campus too, so that if you get overwhelmed, you can go to them. Um, so there's different resources like that for the actual you and your personal well-being of how you're doing in your transition, and as well as for the study materials. There's tutors, so, so a lot of us second years who did well in certain classes and enjoy those, we sign up to be peer tutors, and that's a free service to you guys if you choose to use that. Um, and you can meet with them how much ever you want. So there's a lot of resources, both academic and socially, and just mentally on how to kind of make that transition. Not just the organized things either through school. Uh, there's a lot of camaraderie between the classes here at DMU. For example, I'm a third year. Their second years, we pass things down from our class to theirs. They pass things down from their class to the first year. So everybody helps each other here. It's not cutthroat trying to push each other under. It's trying to help each other out. And uh, class as a whole, we uh, utilize a Facebook page where everybody shares resources for us as a class. If somebody prepares a study guide, your class will be your main support aside from what university gives us as a structured support. Your class will be your main support for the next four years. So everybody here shares resources. Whatever somebody prepared and they found useful, they will share it with the rest of the class. Um, counseling is always available. Upper years, big SIBs, um, when you come in, you will be assigned that person. And if you do click together, they will be your friend. Uh, if you find some other people that you click with, they will still be your friends. You will make a lot of friends in the upperclassmen, and that will be highly useful. And if you do get stressed out, counseling is important. Moreover, that's back to the families. Counseling is available for your families as well. Your spouses, boyfriends, and girlfriends can come and can get help when they are stressed. Um, my wife did not use it personally, but uh, a friend of our family did. They come in and they used help from the university. And they honestly loved it. They sang praises too. For the non-traditional students, what made you want to become a doctor? Also, how did you use your previous career to your advantage? Um, <clears throat> for me, I knew I wanted to become a doctor before I even went to undergrad. I just smoked through undergrad and everything else and was just going full steam and everything was going well. And by the time I got done, I said, this is a great conversation with my parents, by the way. Hey, mom and dad, uh, I need to take some time off and live life a little bit. And so I did. You know, I went and lived life for about 10 years and before I came back. And I don't think my parents ever thought I would return <laughs> back to medical school. Um, but I did. Secondly, how do you use your previous career to your advantage? I kind of had a, a strange previous career. I was involved uh, in law enforcement, both at the local and the federal level. Uh, and so for me, just dealing with people of all different sorts of backgrounds and different sorts of situations that were stressful have really helped make uh, the stressful situations in med school a lot less stressful. So you can find your, I think having any life experience, I don't care what you did before med school, you'll find it helps you. Uh, to have some time in between as long as you can make it back eventually. So I know you had yeah, plenty of money to <laughs> I too had, <laughs> uh, as, I, as I say from all other life experiences, I went to law school and I really thought I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to, I wanted to help people, but I wanted to help people in a population way. And when I got out, I didn't do population law. I did I did commercial law, I did contracts, and that was completely not what I wanted to do. So for me, it was a very, very tough moment. Like, am I really going to live out my life knowing that I haven't done what I always wanted to do? Or am I going to ditch this cushy job and go back to, well, I, ha I had to go back to a $10 an hour job 
subscribing to learn about medicine. So it, it is a conscious life choice. I just realized that for me, my current career at the time was not what I wanted to do. Not at all. I needed a change. I needed to pursue that dream that I almost gave up. And that's what I did. I went around, I turned around, and I think for me, like Ben said, these are the life choices and life experiences that will always help you. One, they will help you empathize with people you're dealing with. You will deal with all kinds of people. They will not be from whatever you stereotype today your patient is. They will always be nothing you ever expected. A patient can always surprise you in any way, in any setting. And that's what life experience prepares you for. Nothing wrong with going to, uh, to medical school right after college because just make sure that while you are in college, you still get those life experiences, however much. Nobody's going to judge you that, oh, my God, she didn't get any life experiences because, you know, she's going from undergrad. Not, not at all. But if you are a non-traditional student, use those life experiences for empathy. Use the life experiences for perseverance. Medicine is a marathon. Perseverance is required, in my opinion. Sorry if anybody disagrees. I, you get to hear me again one more time here. Um, how difficult is it to get into a surgical residency? And the reason they gave me this question is because I'm in my third year right now. I'm on the surgery fast track here at, at DMU. They have tracks in some programs, and Mercy Hospital offers a uh, surgery track. And so I'm in that right now. Um, the surgery is really not that. Uh, it's a mid-level difficulty to get into. The thing you have to ask yourself if you're considering surgery is, is the lifestyle consistent with what you want to do for the rest of your life? And I say this seriously because I am a diehard surgery person the whole way through med school, surgery, 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 that everything I did to line everything up perfectly, I have everything lined up nicely right now, and I get through surgery and I start thinking, man, I don't know if I can do this for 30 more years. So the thing with surgery is keep in mind the lifestyle. It's not that difficult to get into, but the lifestyle can be tough. So stay open-minded throughout it. If you want to know the specific competitiveness of it, uh, the numbers are published on the websites. Go to the ACGME or the AOA, and you can see the number of residencies versus the number of people that get them. And I'd compare it to a mid-level competitiveness. Very doable. Very doable here at DMU. We turn out several surgeons every year. But keep an open mind to the lifestyle. I think about 30% of our class wanted to be surgeons the first day, and by the time you get to the end, the five that are still really digging it uh, get what they need. So it's quite doable. There's a follow-up that's very similar to that, so I'll pass it on. So um, the next question is just how difficult was it to get the um, HPSP uh, from the military, which is the scholarship program that I'm on. Um, and... And honestly, before I answer this question, I'm just going to give a really quick, like, 20-second spiel on what this scholarship is, because I know a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of my classmates didn't know about it, and I think people would have been interested. Um, so I'm in the Army, and I became an officer before I entered medical school, the summer before. And I go to medical school for four years, just like everyone else. The Army pays 100% of my medical school tuition. They pay me a stipend every month, and they pay me... Uh, they pay for all my equipment and my books and all those things. Um, so they pay for all that. I do my residency, and then after my residency, I serve for four years. And the Army has a program like this. The Navy and the Air Force, they all have very, very similar programs. And it's the Health Professional Scholarship Program is what it's called, HPSP. And honestly, the requirements are not very... Um, they're not too strenuous. If you, you have to have gotten accepted into a medical school to be gr given the scholarship. And if you have gotten into a medical school, then your standards, like your grades and your scores are high enough to get the scholarship. It's honestly more a timing thing. Um, they give so many out a year. And you have to get them, like you want to get them the fall before you're going to start. Um, I did it the spring before I was starting medical school, and I got one of the very last spots of the year. So requirement-wise, it's not, it's not difficult. It's more timing thing and getting in, you know, with a good recruiter that will help you out, more military bureaucratic stuff. Um, I went, so I did not go to boot camp this past summer. So the summer between my first and my second year, I did a six-week training um, in San Antonio, 
uh, in Texas. I stayed in a hotel on the Riverwalk. I don't know if anyone's ever been to San Antonio. It's like downtown. It was a super <laughs> nice hotel. We had three weeks of classes where we went to the base every day and did like eight to five lectures, you know, um, like regular school, and then three weeks of um, camp. So we slept in tents and we learned how to shoot rifles and did more like army combat things. So that's, and that's all during medical school, that six weeks is the only strict military training that I'm receiving. So it's not like I'm going every weekend to go to training, something like that. Anyway. So our next question is, how would you describe the environment here at DMU, and do you feel close with your fellow students and classmates? So my answer to that would be extremely close. It's amazing when you're going through the stress of medical school, how much that brings you together. Um, and some of my friends here that I've only known for a year, it feels like I've known for a lifetime. And I've made really awesome friends. Um, so it's really easy. And Nick kind of touched on it with the Facebook page and stuff. We're very cohesive here. And second years try to help first years. And the reach out between groups is awesome. But your classmates, I'm from a small town of 800 people. And some of my good friends are from Chicago, California, places. And we have totally different backgrounds. But it doesn't matter. I feel like somehow DMU picks a group of people to be their students that their personalities are that they want to work together, they want to help people, and that they just fit together well. <laughs> yeah, you really <laughs> get that. That's, that, that was good. <laughs> So the next question is, how are you involved in the community while a student? Um, there's actually, so actually this kind of goes back to another thing that says like what, what I wish I knew before coming. Um, there is actually time that you have for yourself. So if you guys actually think that, we are saying that it is very difficult and we actually meet the challenges and we put in the work for it, but, but realize that um, there is actually time you have for yourself. A lot of people actually still, you know, are involved in sports. Um, I have a friend who actually goes to a hockey game every, every Sunday night or people who wake up at 5 a.m. to do CrossFit, and they're still doing very well in school. So it's very possible to lead a very balanced life. So one of the things that I like to do is I also like to um, uh, get involved in the community. And um, I'm also president of SOMA. And it's one of the larger osteopathic student organizations. And so what we like to do is we like to hold um, uh, community events at elementary schools. It's called What's in a Doctor's Bag. So we'll actually go to these elementary schools and we'll show um, uh, young grade school kids um, what, it, what is it like to go to a doctor's office. What equipment are you going to see? What is it going to be like? And these are things where we're just trying to get them to... Um, be more proactive and be okay about um, going to a doctor's office because sometimes it can be a little bit scary. We also go to a lot of um, we also go to a lot of undergrad institutions. We kind of tell them uh, what is it like to be in a career in medicine. What is it like to apply to med school? Similar to what we're we're holding right now. Um, we also do. There's there's many many different um, communities out there um, and and different organizations. There's specialty organizations. Um, I know that there's people who do House of Mercy and they're actually um, gathering donations for um, uh, for different uh, children here in in Des Moines. Um, is there any other? Or there's there's yes there's 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 Drake Clinic too. So um, actually, do you want to talk more about that? Um, there are a lot of opportunities for community service through the OMM department, which is really great because it's a good way to become comfortable with um, OMM skills and um, really just being comfortable with a hands-on approach to healthcare early on. Um, one thing we do is the Drake Clinic, where we have Drake athletes um, come every other week and receive um, OMM treatments for a couple hours from second-hour students, or second-year students, sorry. Um, we also have a lot of eager first-year students who have been coming a lot and observing and have really started to build their skill set early. Um, so it's a really good way to get some early exposure um, to some clinical skills. Um, we also do osteopathic finish lines. So um, at the um, Des Moines Marathon, um, 
Fight for Air, the AIDS Walk, um, all sorts of races that happen around town. Um, students will provide OMM treatments to athletes at the end of the race, and it's a really great way for us to um, interact with the community and you know, um, share DMU with them and share OMM with them, um, which is a great way to teach people about the osteopathic profession. Um, and aside from that, like Sam said, there's just a lot to do in the community. If you're looking for fun things to do, we have a symphony, and, and I've been to the symphony with groups of people. Um, there are a lot of restaurants and movies and cultural events. There's a world food festival. Um, there are all sorts of things. Sorry. Broadway, Broadway musicals. Um, so there's a lot to do um, as far as community service and as far as just immersing yourself in, in everything in Des Moines. Well, an additional thing, uh, this started this year. Um, if people are from Iowa, they probably saw it in their local newspapers. Our dean is very much involved with the disaster relief. So every single uh, DO student gets trained and gets put on volunteer roles with Iowa Red Cross disaster relief. So should the disaster strike and we have time and opportunity, we essentially have dean's pre-approval after you go through training to go out and assist with a disaster relief that tends to happen usually along the rivers, not on the midline. But uh, this is the first year. So, so far, we got trained just a few months ago. Uh, we didn't have to go anywhere, but the disaster readiness kind of goes along with the mission that school needs to be visible, that school needs to be in a community. School is always out in the community. And uh, community needs to know that they can rely on us. Um, I was just going to add something. Uh, so there's a ton of organizations on campus. And so if you want to get involved in the community with a specific group, you can, of like a population. So pediatrics club does a lot of things with kids. But then we also have outreach programs where we go work with children with Down syndrome or adults with Down syndrome. Um, we also have uh, Wesley Acres, which is a nursing home. Family Medicine does a lot with working with the geriatric population. We have free clinics that you can do. There's a ton of things that if you have an area of medicine that you want to do um, or just a population that you like to work with, I work with the Homeless Camp Outreach Program here in Des Moines, and we also have a program or an organization on campus. So every Sunday they go out and they give medical supplies or just talk coffee to the area homeless people. And so kind of whatever your little thing that you like, your niche of people that you like to work with, there's an organization or people around Des Moines that you can work with to continue that activity or to get involved in a new thing. All right, another question here. Do DMU students take the USMLE as well as the COMLEX? First, a little explanation. USMLE is the allopathic licensing exam boards for the MD side. COMLEX is, are the boards for the DO side. Uh, and I got this question because being a third year, I've actually finished my boards. In fact, these second years should be home studying for their boards right now. I'm not sure why they're here tonight. Just kidding. Um, but for my class, uh, we had several people take the USMLE as well as the COMLEX. About half the class took the USMLE. Um, you take the first boards during the summer of your second year, and then you take a series of boards thereafter all the way up into your residency. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to get into the detail. There's a merger coming up between the AOA and the uh, ACGME programs and all this. I'm going to leave my email address, as I encourage the other students on the panel to do today before we're done on the board. You can email us for details. But, you know, it, it really depends on your situation. I don't want to give blanket advice on taking the USMLE or the COMLEX or both, but there's specific situations where each might apply. And in the near future, in the time that you would matriculate in med school, there will still most likely be a USMLE plus a COMLEX. And the dean may have spoken to this earlier. I'm not sure. But uh, yes, our students do take the USMLE, and not only do they take it, they, they did quite well this last year. So it's pretty common. What is your favorite aspect of osteopathic medicine? It's the people aspect. It's the fact that I get to care for the people, and that is the most important thing. You go out, well, I don't know about you, 
I went into medicine to care for the people. My patients are people. My patients are humans. My patients um, have their own needs, passions, souls, and I'm there to try and help all of it. Can I, by myself, alone? No. But osteopathic medicine teaches you to do it to the maximum extent while also relying on whoever, need, uh, whoever you need to rely. You're never alone. Osteopathic medicine, DMU specifically, is amazing at preparing you to work in teams. Osteopathic medicine is amazing at preparing you to work in a team that would include a social worker, a priest for a religious person, a financial counselor, a nurse, a pharmacist. You know, when you go out, as a physician, you bear a lot of responsibility, but you are never alone, and your patient should never be alone. And that's what osteopathic medicine, for me, prepares me the most. I can speak to uh, a new experience with this because I'm actually out in the clinics this year, and you know, even today, it's kind of what Nick said, but it, osteopathic medicine has prepared me to treat the patients as a whole person and it's just amazing feeling once you get past and the second years are almost there they're going to be there very shortly but you you finally get out from behind the classroom and you treat your first patient and you start getting better at it and start seeing all the skills you were taught and how they come through and it's just an amazing feeling when you take all this knowledge you crammed into your head and actually apply it to a person to help them with their with their personal situation or their health issue. And I think that um, DMU and osteopathic medicine did a great job of preparing me to, to handle that. Yeah, I think for me, something really special about osteopathic medicine is just that there's such a heavy emphasis on um, empathy and not just being sympathetic, but being empathic and really understanding your patient's experience um, through their eyes. Um, and something else that we really focus on a lot here is just um, just the power of touch. Um, I think medicine in more recent years has become kind of hands-off. Um, and that's something that osteopathic medicine, to me, really addresses, is the power of touch and being in contact with your patient, um, gaining their trust. Um, the only thing I would add to these wonderful responses are like as a second year specifically or even a first year, learning OMM, you can actually help treat your family and friends and you have a tool because you don't know all of the medical diseases. There's so much to learn and you're not going to know it by second year when you go on to your clinical rotations. That's what you're going to continue to learn. But you actually have some things that you can do with your hands to physically make people feel better. And that's cool after one year of medicine to be able to help someone. Well, congratulations on being here tonight. This is a have to even take the initiative to show up at something like this. And your commitment already. Congratulate you for coming out and staying here until 9 o'clock. And um, we ju I just put all of our emails on here. So really, please feel free to email all of us. We'll be more than happy to help you. So, um, I want to point out who they are. So you're like, I want to talk yeah. to her. And you're like, I have no Nick, I go by Nick, but the first name says Mikolai there. Okay. Jacob was the OMM fellow, the fifth year student that we talked to earlier tonight. Molly. Write down those emails if you have. These folks are going to stay here for just a couple more minutes, so if you want to ask them individual questions, please feel free to do so. <coughs> um, Anna, Gina, and I will also stick around if you have questions for us as well. Um, in terms of admission, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we definitely appreciate it and want to make sure that you leave with your questions answered. So have a good night. Thank you.